Hello history fans and welcome back to the podcast that helps you learn a little bit of history. Today I'm going to start a new series, maybe if you like it, called Myths and Makeup, where for the audio listeners I'm going to be talking about a person, an event or something to do with mythology, probably most commonly Greek and Roman because that's what I know, what I like. And for the people who are watching, I'm going to do my makeup as I chat to you about it. Um, I'm going to do my makeup based off of what or who I'm talking about. So I thought we'd start the series with Aphrodite and slash or Venus because I have this Venus palette by Lime Crime. So we're going to start with Aphrodite. Aphrodite being the Greek version of the Romans Venus. And we'll start with the Greek because that came first. And the Romans borrowed Greek mythology about a thousand years later. The difference between the Greek and the Roman is really interesting and is similar to the differences we see in their societies and their general way of living. So the Greek gods um, often have a human form and they're seen as beautiful and they're based on human traits like love or hate, whereas the Romans often didn't have a physical form and they are not based on traits, they are based on actions. I suppose it's like like a military way of thinking and it was supposed to be like work as a team to make a difference rather than relying on one person supposedly but the romans are much more less artsy i always see the greeks as more artsy you know so aphrodite is the goddess of love and other things that we will get to later and homus tells us that she is the daughter of zeus and dion or diony whereas hesiod's theogony tells us that she came out of the sea foam. So, the private parts of Uranus, or heaven, were severed, fell into the sea, and created sea foam that Aphrodite then emerged from. And the image you probably immediately think of is Botticelli's Venus in the seashell. That's the Roman depiction, but I think it fairly depicts the Greek version as well, because they're practically the same. And the Greek word aphros means foam, so the first bit of her name could be a reflection of how she was created. And because of that origin story, she's worshipped as a goddess of the sea and seafaring sometimes. Because she has different origin stories, it shows that she wasn't necessarily there right at the beginning of Greek mythology, and her mythology story has developed over time, being very influenced by Near Eastern goddesses like Inanna from Sumerian and Ishtar from Arcadian or Akkadian, sorry, um, mythology stories. She's developed from those and there's influences from those goddesses seen in her story. They were often associated with fertility, war and power and characterised with fierce jealousy and sometimes aggressive sexuality. Watchers of the video, by the way, I wouldn't normally put this much blush on, but this has obviously got to be a pink look for the goddess of love. So we're going all out. <laughs> Look at all these colours, I'm so excited to use it. Anyway, carrying on. Cyprus is an important island for Aphrodite's creation um, stories and myths, um, as it was a big crossing point for different cultures, and it's possible that this is where the different traditions of her myth come from, um, with their local fertility goddess being adapted by the Eastern deities, and then Greece adapted the Cypriot goddess into Aphrodite. She had a sanctuary at Paphos in Cyprus too, which is where Homer says was um, it was her biggest place of worship. It said that her cult probably originated prehistorically on the Minoan island of Kythera as well. So she's she is a prehistoric goddess in some form for different religions and cultures, but she slowly warps into Aphrodite, essentially. <laughs> it's going to turn another light on because I feel like we're getting a bit dark. Bear with. I don't know if that's made it any better, but we're going to roll with it for today. Um, in mythology, Aphrodite is mostly involved with matters of the heart, of course, being the goddess of love. She does get into trouble with Zeus, though, causing improper unions, and people can't be immune to her charms as well, so she's, yeah, mostly matters of the heart. But she's also manipulative and powerful, not just some sexy causer of love in the wrong places. For example, she offered Helen, the Queen of Sparta, as a bribe to Paris, which started the 10-year Trojan War, all because she wanted to win the beauty competition that he was judging between her, Hera, and Athena. So I think she's quite rightly worshipped as a goddess of war in Sparta and Thebes and places like that. Also something I find quite interesting is that prostitutes viewed her as their patron, but her usual 
public cult seemed to be more solemn and even austere, which is like sombre and stern, which I think is so interesting, the contrasting people who worship her. I think she's very much adaptable to what you want her to be. <laughs> For what purpose you want to worship her. Homer's Odyssey tells us that she was paired with or married to Hephaestus, the god of blacksmiths, I believe, but she saw him, as most people also saw him, as a lame god, so she actually spent most of her time having an affair with Ares, the god of war, um, who she had four children with, who were called Harmonia, Phobos, Demios, and, of course, Eros, the god of love. She did also have mortal affairs, though, of course, you couldn't expect any less. With Anchises, who was a Trojan shepherd, um, she had Aeneas and Adonis, who were two other important or well-known figures of Greek mythology. In art, before the 5th century BCE, she wasn't necessarily distinguishable from other goddesses, and it wasn't until Praxiteles made the first full-scale nude statue of her, which then became the basis model for all the Hellenic depictions you see of her. So, we now recognise Aphrodite, but what about Venus? In Roman religions, she is much more matronly and associated with empresses a lot. Um, she's used as a base of portraits for imperial women quite commonly. Um, but she is nude still a lot <laughs> most of the time, although paintings at Pompeii do show her in different forms, which is really interesting to see. Venus does have more abilities than Aphrodite, supposedly, being the goddess of victory as well. Although I would argue that that's like her being the god, a goddess, sorry, of war in Greek mythology. <laughs> her origin story tends to be the same as in Hesiod's Theogony, um, apart from it's Saturn's castration <laughs> rather than Uranus, um, and his blood falls into the sea, creating the sea foam that she forms from. And we also of course, see many artworks <laughs> depicting this, um, and the Renaissance image we spoke about, or I mentioned earlier, is actually of Venus, um, rather than Aphrodite. Hephaestus is Vulcan, and Ares is Mars, but the stories are essentially the same, with Eros being Cupid, which I'm sure you all know. <laughs> and the other three children are also still the little winged deities representing different aspects of love. I think in the Roman story she has more children than she does in the Greek version. Um, she has a child with Hermes, which is Hermaphroditus. Hang on, let me look. Hermaphro Hermaphroditus, apologies. <laughs> um, and that is androgyny. Hermes or Zeus then give her Fortuna, Luck and Fate. And Bacchus gave her a child as well, um, a fertility god often depicted as a big willy. And they may be with the parents of the three graces too, although that's just from poor Xanius, and more commonly they're the children of Jupiter and Uranomi. So I think that's not... She didn't give us the graces. I'm just trying to add some pink glitter because I think that's what she would want. <laughs> In Roman stories, she did also have mortal children as well, like Aeneas, who was destined to found Rome after being guided by her, although I thought that was Romulus and Remus, so I need to do a bit more research on that part of the story, I think. This next bit, I'm just going to read from my notes because I'm not going to remember it all, and I also need to do my mascara, so that's not going to happen at the same time. <laughs> um, the first temple, let me just pick it up. The first temple to Venus obsequens, which was obedient Venus, comes in 285 BCE, and it's on the Aventine Hill. Then the Sibylline Oracle, or Sibylline Oracle, says that Rome should persuade Venus Ercincta, Venus Eryx, to change sides. Then they would win the Second Punic War against Carthage. So they siege Eryx, and take her image back to Rome and offered her a temple, and her image from here then became Venus Gentrix, Venus the Mother. This cult was formed on the Capitoline Hill, reserved for the higher classes. Then in 181, the cult and temple of Venus Erycina, and in 114, Venus Verticordia, changer of hearts, was established for the plebeians, or the plebs. So there's lots of cults in her name for different people. And the more I look at this, the more I hate the glitter, so we're just going to have to... 
ignore that, I can't take it off. By the time we reached the end of the Roman Republic, it was common to ask for her favour, like Pompey dedicating a temple to Venus Victrix. Sorry, Victrix. <laughs> Uh, victory, or Caesar, who claimed to be her descendant and claimed he had her favour as well. In the Aeneid as well, in her celestial form, is as the evening star. She lifts his soul to the heavens, as well as then guiding Aeneas to Latium, because the planet Venus was thought to be, or rightly so, was her celestial form. Um, brightly the night sky, but was also the alternate name for the planet Venus, because they didn't know what that was at the time. So to end the video I thought you might like to hear some actual different versions of the myths rather than whatever it is that I ended up just rambling about just then. Um, so let's start with Robert Graves' version, this big book of Greek myths. And let's read her story. I'm very sorry that you have to look at this makeup in this lighting. I look bizarre. Audio listeners, be grateful you're not watching. <laughs> oh dear. Right. Aphrodite could seldom be persuaded to lend the other goddesses her magic girdle, which made everyone fall in love with its wearer, for she was jealous of her position. Zeus had given her in marriage to Hephaestus, the lame smith god, but the true father of the three children with whom she presented him, Phobus, Demius, Demus, not Demius, and Harmonia, was Ares, the straight-limbed, impetuous, drunken, and quarrelsome god of war. Hephaestus knew nothing of the deception until one night the lovers stayed too long together in bed at Ares' Thracian palace. Then Helios, as he rose, saw them at their sport and told tales to Hephaestus. Hephaestus angrily retired to his forge and hammered out a bronze hunting net as fine as gossamer, but quite unbreakable, which he secretly attached to the posts and side of his marriage bed. He told Aphrodite, who returned from Thrace, all smiles, explaining that she had been away on business at Corinth. Pray excuse me, dear wife, I am taking a short holiday on Lemnos, my favourite island. Aphrodite did not offer to accompany him, and, when he was out of sight, sent hurriedly for Ares, who soon arrived. The two went merrily to bed, but at dawn found themselves entangled in the net, naked and unable to escape. Hephaestus, turning back from his journey, surprised them there, and summoned all the gods to witness his dishonour. He then announced that he would not release his wife until the valuable marriage gifts which he had paid her adopted father Zeus were restored to him. Up ran the gods to watch Aphrodite's embarrassment, but the goddesses, from a sense of delicacy, stayed in their houses. Apollo, nudging Hermes, asked, You would not mind being in Ares' position, would you? Net and all. Hermes swore by his own head that he would not, even if there were three times as many nets, and all the goddesses were looking on with disapproval. At this, both gods laughed uproariously, but Zeus was so disgusted that he refused to hand back the marriage gifts, or to interfere in a vulgar dispute between a husband and wife. Declaring that Hephaestus was a fool to have made the affair public, Poseidon, who at sight of Aphrodite's naked body had fallen in love with her, concealed his jealousy of Ares, and pretended to sympathise with Hephaestus. Since Zeus refuses to help, he said, I will undertake that Ares, as a fee for his release, pays the equivalent of the marriage gifts in question. That is all very well, Hephaestus replied gloomily, but if Ares defaults, you will have to take his place under the net. In Aphrodite's company, Apollo asked, laughing. I cannot think that Ares will default, Poseidon said nobly, but if he should do so, I am ready to pay the debt and marry Aphrodite myself. So Ares was set at liberty and returned to Thrace, and Aphrodite went to Paphos, where she renewed her virginity in the sea. Flattered by Hermes' frank confession of his love for her, Aphrodite presently spent a night with him, the fruit of which was Hermaphroditus, a double-sexed being, and equally pleased by Poseidon's intervention on her behalf, she bore him two sons. Rhodus and Herophilius. Needless to say, Ares defaulted, pleading that if Zeus would not pay, why should he? In the end, nobody paid, because Hephaestus was madly in love with Aphrodite, and had no real intention of divorcing her. Later, Aphrodite yielded to Dionysus, and bore him Priapus, an ugly child with enormous genitals. It was Hera who had given him the obscene appearance in disapproval of Aphrodite's promiscuity. He is a gardener and carries a pruning knife. Though Zeus never lay with his adopted daughter Aphrodite, as some say that he did. The magic of her girdle put him under constant temptation, and at last he decided to humiliate her by making her fall desperately in love with a mortal. This was the handsome Anchises, 
king of the Dardanians, a grandson of Ilus, and, one night, when he was asleep in his herdsman's hut on Trojan Mount Ida, Aphrodite visited him in the guise of a Phrygian princess, clad in a dazzling red robe, and lay with him on a couch spread with the skins of bears and lions, while bees buzzed drowsily about them. When they parted at dawn, she revealed her identity, and made him promise not to tell anyone that she had slept with him. Anchises was horrified to learn that he had uncovered the nakedness of a goddess, and begged her to spare his life. She assured him that he had nothing to fear, and that their son would be famous. Some days later, while Anchises was drinking with his companions, one of them asked, "'Would you not rather sleep with the daughter of so-and-so than with Aphrodite herself?' "'No,' he replied, unguardedly. "'Having slept with both, I find the question inept.' Zeus overheard this boast and threw a thunderbolt at Anchises, which would have killed him outright had not Aphrodite interposed her girdle, and thus diverted the bolt into the ground at his feet. Nevertheless, the shock so weakened Anchises that he could never stand upright again, and Aphrodite, after bearing his son Aeneas, soon lost her passion for him. One day, the king Cinerus of Cyprian, but some call him King Phoenix of Bibulus, and some King Theus of Assyrian, foolishly boasted that her daughter, Smyna, was more beautiful even than Aphrodite. The goddess avenged this insult by making Smyna fall in love with her father and climb into his bed one dark night, when her nurse had made him too drunk to realise what he was doing. Later, Cyrus discovered that he was both the father and grandfather of Smyrna's unborn child and, wild with wrath, seized a sword and chased her from the palace. He overtook her on the brow of a hill, but Aphrodite hurriedly changed Smyna into a nymph tree, which the descending sword split in half. Out tumbled the infant Adonis. Aphrodite, already repenting of the mischief that she had made, concealed Adonis in a chest, which she entrusted to Persephone, queen of the dead, asking her to stow it away in a dark place. Persephone had the curiosity to open the chest and found Adonis inside. He was so lovely that she lifted him out and brought him up in her own palace. The news reached Aphrodite, who at once visited Tartarus to claim Adonis. And when Persephone would not assent, having by now made him her lover, she appealed to Zeus. Zeus, well aware that Aphrodite wanted to lie with Adonis, refused to judge so unsavoury a dispute, and transferred it to a lower court, presided over by the muse Calliope. Calliope's verdict was that Persephone and Aphrodite had equal claims on Adonis, Aphrodite for arranging his birth, Persephone for rescuing him from the chest, but that he should be allowed a brief annual holiday from the amorous demands of both these insatiable goddesses. She therefore divided the year into three equal parts, of which he was to spend one with Persephone, one with Aphrodite, and the third by himself. Aphrodite did not play fair. By wearing her magic girdle all the time, she persuaded Adonis to give her his own share of the year, grudged the share due to Persephone, and disobey the court order. Persephone, justly aggrieved, went to Thrace, where she told her benefactor Ares that Aphrodite now preferred Adonis to himself. A mere mortal, she cried, and effeminate at that. Ares grew jealous, and disguised as a wild boar, rushed at Adonis, who was out hunting on Mount Lebanon, and gored him to death before Aphrodite's eyes. Anemones sprang from his blood, and his soul descended to Tartarus. Aphrodite went tearfully to Zeus and pleaded that Adonis should not have to spend more than the gloomier half of the year with Persephone, but might be her companion for the summer months. This Zeus magnanimously granted. But some say that Apollo was the boar, and revenged himself for an injury Aphrodite had done him. Once, to make Adonis jealous, Aphrodite spent several nights at Lilibaeum with Brutes the Argonaut, and by him became the mother of Eryx, a king of Sicily. Her children by Adonis were one son, Golgus, founder of Cyprian Golgi, and a daughter, Beroe, founder of Beroa in Thrace. And some say that Adonis, not Dionysus, was the father of her son, Priapus. The fates assigned to Aphrodite one divine duty only, namely to make love. But one day, Athene, catching her surreptitiously at work on a loom, complained that her own prerogatives had been infringed and threatened to abandon them altogether. Aphrodite apologised profusely, and has never done a hand's turn of work since. And that... Is Robert Graves' version. I also have this book, The Mighty Goddess, World Myths, by Sally Palm Clayton and Sophie Herxheimer. And there's four different versions, two Aphrodite and two Venuses. Let's have a little look. So we start with Aphrodite, Foam Born, the Greece version. 
I don't ever really know how to show you the book I'm reading. Let's try this. No, that's weird. Maybe that, no. <laughs> Sorry, audio listeners, this one's a bit dodge for you. Okay, we'll do that. The golden one was made of desire and born from her father's testicles. Her father was Uranus, Sky. Uranus, coupled with Mother Earth, Gaia, and Earth gave birth to a world of children. Sky was threatened by his children, afraid that they would overthrow him. So he pushed his children underground, buried them deep inside Mother Earth. Gaia groaned in pain and fury and urged her children to rebel. She formed a sickle of black flint within her body. Her eldest son, Kronos, took the knife. Kronos reached up towards his father, flashed the blade, sliced his father's testicles off and hurled them into the sea. The deed was done. Uranus could not produce any more children. But that was not the end of the testicles. The testicles bobbed on the waves, floated out to sea, and white foam gathered around them. The foam frothed and bubbled, foamed and formed into a woman. She was a marvellous beauty with glistening skin and tumbling hair. She was desire embodied, Aphrodite, foam born. Aphrodite drifted on the briny water. There was a splash and a spirit appeared beside her. Nerites, a triton of the sea, admired her, circling her, splashing her playfully. You are a pearl. Aphrodite was enchanted. Desire rose inside her and she wrapped her legs around Nerites. They became lovers, plunging and diving together in the salty sea. When they reached shallow waters, Aphrodite offered Nerites her hand. I must take my place among the gods and goddesses, she said, and you will be beside me. Nerites shook his head. I cannot leave the sea. This is where I belong. But you belong to love now, said Aphrodite. She clasped his hand, and as their fingers twined together, water trickled through her fingers and Nerites vanished and in the palm of Aphrodite's hand was a perfect cockle shell. Aphrodite climbed into the shell and was carried over the waves to the shore of an island. The golden one, goddess of love, Aphrodite, foam-born, stepped onto land. Love had arrived, and wherever she went, she spread desire. Some say the island was Cythera, some say Cyprus. There are important shrines to Aphrodite on both islands. Pilgrims would honour Aphrodite with cockle shells, a tradition that continued into Christian practice, and a type of bilvalve shell is known as a Venus clam. And on to the next one. This book actually talks about the same goddesses in all different cultures, so we have, like, this section on love has Greek, Roman, Mesopotamian, let's see the others, Chinese, Indian, Haitian, so many. Then we have the net of Venus, which is a Roman one. Venus, goddess of beauty, was dressed by two veiled maidens, the Horae, the Hours. Beauty was dressed by time. They wrapped the finest slip around her curvy body, placed a wreath of gold on her head, hung jewels from her ears, and a thread of silver around her neck. They then tied a fine band of pearls across her body. The girdle of pearls wound between her breasts and beneath her heart. The girdle had magic properties. No one could resist its spell. All would be drawn to Venus. So wherever Venus went, she spread desire. All the gods fell in love with Venus, and among her lovers were Neptune, Bacchus, Pluto, and Jupiter himself. Jupiter became concerned and declared that Venus should be restrained. He arranged a marriage between Venus and Vulcan, god of fire. The marriage seemed to be Jupiter's joke, the most beautiful goddess marrying the most unattractive god. Vulcan was a hulk of a man, who spent all his time working in his forge, he was covered in grime, always sweaty, his back hunched, his limbs twisted from hard labour. Venus was not impressed, and as soon as the wedding was over, she tightened her girdle, and Mars, god of war, caught her eye. When Vulcan was working in his forge, Venus led Mars to her chamber and enjoyed him. And after that, she enjoyed him every afternoon. One time, as they lay entwined on Venus's bed, the sun beamed through an upper window and lit up their passionate embrace. The sun was horrified. What outrageous deception, and from a new bride. The sun rushed to tell Vulcan. When Vulcan heard that his wife was having an affair, he was so shocked he dropped the sword he was crafting and it shattered on the ground. My heart is shattered too, said Vulcan. I will destroy them. Vulcan took up his tools and began to work on something new. With tiny taps he forged a net, crafted of bronze so fine the links could not be seen. The net was lighter than a spider's web and reacted to the slightest touch, closing tight in an instant. The net was a love trap. Vulcan arranged the net above Venus's bed 
hanging it from the wooden beams in the ceiling. That afternoon, as Venus pulled Mars onto the bed, they triggered the net. It fell on top of them, its tiny links clamping tight, fastening around their bodies, locking in place, and they were unable to move. Vulcan threw open the doors and roared, Come and see what I have caught. Come and see the guilty ones. Gods and goddesses crowded around the bedroom door and saw Mars and Venus ensnared. Their bodies were trapped in the gleaming net. Venus and Mars were caught fast in the very act of love. Look, cried Vulcan, see their shameful behaviour. The gods and goddesses roared with laughter, and Mercury turned to Apollo and said, I wish I could get shamed like that. The gods begged Vulcan to set Mars and Venus free, but Vulcan refused. So Bacchus slipped off and fetched his wine jug and bowl. He poured out dark liquid and, against his own rules, gave Vulcan four bowls of wine. Vulcan started showing off, boasting about his skills, then displaying how his love trap worked. Mars and Venus were released at last. Venus did not apologise to Vulcan. Instead, she vowed to herself that she would never be faithful. She would cast her net and spread it wide. And she murmured, I will punish the sun for this. I'll make him suffer for love. Venus made the sun fall in love with a simple peasant girl. The sun followed the girl everywhere, even to her grave. His beloved was buried alive, and the sun kept watch, pushing his hot rays into the cold soil to bring her back to life. And the sun is still trying to keep his beloved warm. Meanwhile, Mercury swaggered up to Venus and set about getting himself shamed as soon as possible. Venus tightened her girdle. He would be the first of many. Venus and Aphrodite share the same stories. Venus's image lived on through sculptures, paintings and poems long after the Roman Empire was over. Then we have a Scandinavian version, and now Aphrodite and Anchises. Aphrodite was thinking of all her love affairs. There was Hermes, Ares, Poseidon, Dionysus, Zeus, and more. She laughed at all the liaisons gone wrong, the broken hearts. Zeus watched her. How cruel, he said. A god may have his way with anything he desires, but it's cruel if a goddess does the same, said Aphrodite. Gods can make love with beasts and mortals and father their children, but goddesses may not. I make love to whoever I like, and I will mother their children too. Zeus parted the clouds that swirled around Mount Olympus and looked down on earth. He pointed at the island of Crete. Then take him. Aphrodite looked down at a young herdsman following his cattle. Anchises was a simple lad, living in a tent on top of Mount Ida. Do you want a war, she said. Then I will enjoy him, and have his child. I will mother a boy, and will change history. Aphrodite flashed down to Crete, to her temple at Paphos. There the three graces bathed her. They rubbed perfumed oil into her skin and her hair, and dressed her in an airy robe. Aphrodite walked through the fields and forests to the top of Mount Ida. As she walked, wild animals followed her, Grey wolves waving their tails, lions bowing their heads, leopards rubbing up against her bare legs, gazelles nuzzling their noses into her hand, and birds circling above her head. She saw the herdsman's tent in the distance, and Anchises sitting under the canopy playing the lute. Aphrodite lifted her hands towards the wild beasts and raised a finger, filling them with such desire that they all ran off to couple. Then Aphrodite wrapped her goddess glory in a secret cloud and made her way to the tent disguised as a mortal girl. Anchises looked up. Where have you come from? Are you a spirit of nature or a goddess from the sky? I am a mere mortal, and I am looking for Anchises. I was a maiden at the temple of Artemis, serving the great goddess, when a messenger Hermes caught me and carried me here. He placed me on this mountain and told me I am to be the bride of Anchises. The herdsman's heart thumped in his chest. All his dreams and prayers had come true in a moment. I am he. I am Anchises. Or Anchises. <laughs> he invited the maiden into his tent. He made her a seat on a pile of soft hides and furs, and gave her cool, creamy milk to drink. Shall we go and meet your family as tradition requires, he asked. Surely we are allowed to get to know each other first, said Aphrodite, winding her fingers through his hands, if we are to be husband and wife. A smile flickered on her lips as she loosened her robe. Heavy perfume filled the air, and Anchises was unable to resist. He pulled her into his arms, and they fell on the furs. Like wolves, leopards, gazelles, they took their pleasure from each other again and again, until they lay exhausted. Then Aphrodite unbound the cloud, rose into the air above Anchises, and revealed her goddess glory. Golden Aphrodite filled the tent with light, so bright, 
Anchises was forced to shield his eyes from her divine beauty. "'Have mercy, goddess,' he cried. "'If I had known who you were, I would never have touched you. "'A mortal must not make love with a god, "'and now bad luck will follow me forever.' "'I have conceived,' said Aphrodite, "'and it cannot be undone. "'But your son will be brought up in secret, "'and no one will know what happened here today. "'Have no fear. "'Your son is destined for great things.' Aphrodite returned to Zeus triumphant. She had seduced a mortal and would give birth to a mortal boy. When the baby was born, she called him Aeneas and gave him to the forest nymphs to bring up in secret. No one knew who the boy's parents are, except Francises, who watched his son Aeneas become a powerful warrior, then leader of the Trojan army. Aeneas would change history. Anchises could not help feeling proud of his son, and one night, after much drinking, he boasted that he was the warrior's father, bragging that he had made love with the golden one herself. Suddenly there was a crack of thunder. Zeus sent a bolt of lightning that struck Anchises on the leg, maiming him forever. Anchises had met his bad luck and limped for the rest of his life. When the city of Troy burned, Anchises could not run and was unable to escape the flames. But Aphrodite was watching and she sent Aeneas to help. The warrior lifted his father up onto his back and carried him through the fire to safety. Aphrodite smiled as the city sank to ruins. She had got her war. Aphrodite was partly responsible for the Trojan War. She bribed Paris to give her the golden apple for the fairest in exchange for Helen, the most beautiful woman in the world. Helen's abduction caused the war between the Greeks and the Trojans. Aphrodite's stories merge with those of Venus, and for the myth of how Aphrodite really fell in love, we'll see Roman, Venus and Adonis. Which is next? Venus had many affairs, but never fell in love herself. And she had many children. Some were born in secret. Some were given to nymphs to raise. Some had no idea who their father was. Others did not know Venus was their mother. Among her children were Hermaphroditus, son of Mercury, who merged with a lover, becoming neither male nor female, but both. And Priapus, son of Bacchus, who was born with such an enormous phallus, Venus hid him in the mountains. Venus had daughters too, Fortuna, goddess of fate, and Swadela, goddess of persuasion. But Venus was a lover, not a mother, and she sent all her children away. All except one. No one knew who his father was. Perhaps he was the only son of Vulcan. Or was his father Zephyrus, the wind? Maybe it was Mars, or was it Jupiter? No one was sure. But the baby was gorgeous, with golden curls, rosy lips, chubby cheeks, dimples, and rolls of fat around his thighs. Venus adored him, and called him Cupid, love. The goddess of desire had given birth to love. Venus indulged Cupid and encouraged his naughtiness. She got Vulcan to make him a tiny bow and set of arrows. Then she urged Cupid to mischief sending him across the world on her missions to burn up hearts, ignite old flames and destroy homes. Cupid's aim was true, and his love dart always hit its mark. No one could escape Cupid's arrow, not even his mother. One day Venus was parting the clouds on top of Mount Olympus, and looking down on earth to see what was going on. When her son crept up behind her, Cupid, with his quiver of arrows slung over one shoulder, bent to press his rosy lips to his mother's cheek, when one of his arrows grazed her neck. At that very moment, Venus saw a young man. Her heart leapt. The youth was hunting, his sturdy arms carrying a bow, his powerful legs bronzed by the sun. It was Adonis, the hunter. Cupid's magic arrow inflamed Venus, and she was overwhelmed with desire for Adonis. Venus flashed down to earth. Adonis was cleaning his weapons and did not look up. This was not the reaction the goddess was used to. She tightened her girdle of pearls. It never failed. But Adonis picked up his weapons and ran off to hunt. Venus tucked her robe above her knee and ran after him. She chased Adonis as he hunted stag, fox, hares. When Adonis stretched out under the shade of an olive tree to rest, Venus lay beside him. Adonis did not move to kiss her. He did not even take her hand. Venus suddenly felt shy, unable to reach out, unable to seduce him. Cupid, have mercy, she murmured. What has happened? This was not her usual lust, but something quite different. Something she'd never felt before. Venus had fallen in love. The goddess could not bear to be without Adonis. 
she neglected her rites, no longer visited her temples, did not attend the assembly of the gods. Instead, she followed Adonis everywhere. He seemed to accept her, and when he was resting, Venus would wrap her arms around him and cling to him, just like a mortal girl. I do not want to lose you, love, she whispered. Take no risks while hunting. Wolves, lions, bears are too fierce. Hunt only small creatures, my darling. Leave dangerous beasts alone. And she pressed herself against him. All her goddess powers gone. Alone in the forest one day, Adonis came upon a wild boar. He smiled and lifted his spear. What a marvellous creature! And safe to hunt. Venus said nothing of boar. Adonis gave chase, hurling his spear. But the spear fell short, piercing the boar on its flank. The boar bellowed, turned and charged, savagely burying its tusks into Adonis's thigh. Adonis cried out and fell to the ground. Venus flew to his side and found red blood spreading out around her beloved. She tore off her robe, pressed it to the gaping wound and tried to stem the flow. She took Adonis in her lap and held him tight, but his blood pumped away, draining into the earth. His face became pale and then his breathing stopped. Adonis died in Venus's arms. "'Curse you, cruel fate, for taking my loved one!' cried Venus. "'My grief shall never end. It will be remembered for ever.' Adonis's blood began to bubble, to bloom and to change into a deep red flower, the anemone. Anemone? The anemone. <laughs> Fragile crimson petals hung loosely from a stem. The anemone <laughs> would be her memorial. The anemone, or the anemone, is a wind flower and does not live long. As soon as the flower blooms and opens, the merest gust of breeze catches the petals and, shaken by the wind, it's blown away. But each spring the blood-red flower returns, and every time it blooms and fades, Venus loves and loves and loves, and never stops loving Adonis. And that is the end of all our different versions. I do hope you've enjoyed, if you're listening. Please make sure you follow the podcast and rate it as many stars as you think I deserve. (laughs) If you're watching, please do subscribe and like the video. Let me know if you do want to see more of these. Hopefully next time the makeup goes a bit better. It does look better not on camera. I don't think this light is doing me any favours. Let's see. Maybe I should have had the light like that. But then it's too dark. I don't know. I'm rambling. I'm going to leave it now. Thank you very much for watching and listening. I'll see you next time. Bye bye.